So my question to you today is that if an armed assailant broke into your house 5 a.m. in the morning, what would you do to defend yourself and defend any other persons that are in the house? And would you feel ready? That is my question to you today. And I want to take us through a case study that happened around five weeks ago. As you know, I often like to wait on some of these stories to see if more information comes out. But the Reverend Stephen Gossel was murdered in his own home. And if you're like me, an old Anglican, uh, you will know that a rectory is generally a house attached or associated to a church. So on this occasion, his house was attached to a church. And at 5 a.m. in the morning, he woke to a sound of someone forcing entry. And by the time the police arrived, tragically, he had been stabbed to death. He lost his life. And we see that the assailant was 43 years old. Now, my first interesting piece about this story is that it was a small, sleepy town of less than a thousand people. And this was their second murder by home invasion in as many weeks. So this was shocking for the community. But not only did this murder happen once, but they had two murders during a home invasion in less than two weeks. So it shocked the community of a small, sleepy town. No, I know many of you, my clever listeners and viewers, will be saying, Simon, will we come up against that bias where someone says, we're just a small town in Texas, nothing is ever going to happen here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but this incident shows that crime can occur anywhere. So let's talk a little bit then about who was the assailant or what is now known. Well, he had no connection to Nebraska. He was from Iowa. He was wanted in five states, a very checkered past, a career criminal. And what is really interesting about this is that he breaks into the home. The homeowner, the the reverend, must confront him or he's, he's found by the assailant. And he murders the reverend. And then when the police arrive, he doesn't leave, he doesn't flee. The Reverend is deceased and he's found, the the assailant this is, is found lying on his back in the shape of a cross. A very, very unusual um, set of circumstances here. I don't know right now if mental health is involved, if there's any significance to the um, symbology of lying on the Reverend's back in the shape of a cross, but that is how he was found when the police arrived. He didn't try to escape, he didn't run away. He lied on the person, he lied on the Reverend's back in the shape of a cross, very unusual. Another interesting piece in this story is that the Reverend himself in 2007 pleaded guilty to theft by deception for embezzling $127,000 from the church, from our previous church, and he was sentenced to probation, ordered to pay restitution, Um, But investigators don't believe that his death was in any way connected to criminality, i.e. they don't believe there's an association between the assailant that murdered him and his past. And I don't know whereabouts this story was, but I know that I read it. And actually, it wasn't the first time that he had embezzled the church where he was at. I believe it also embezzled more funds there. So in 2007, He embezzled over $100,000, and the current church that he was at, there was also press releases and and information to press to say, but again, he had been suspected of embezzlement, and he could even actually been on um, sort of uh, leave at the time when this attack occurred. Very unusual, his background tied in, but um, so far, no one's saying there's any association between him and the assailant, but clearly... This reverend has also has a checkered past because twice he's committed embezzlement of significant funds against his churches. How is he still in that position? That's, that's a video for another day. So as I mentioned, this was a second killing in a month. Both killings happened during break-ins, home invasions, and the police were telling everyone to please lock your doors to stay safe. Now, I touched on this before when I mentioned this is a small, sleepy town, less than a thousand people. 
And it's really important to understand the routine activities theory. Now, in 1979, two criminologists, Felsen and Cohen, they wrote a white paper saying that crime wasn't about social or economic status. It's not about race or ethnicity. Crime is simply about motivation. Motivation causes crime. And they were set out to, and this is still widely regarded as one of the most theoretical um, criminology frameworks around, around why crime occurs. And they said, really, that you need a motivated offender. You need a suitable or soft target. And you then need the absence of capable guardianship, those things that stand in their way. So we cannot control someone's motivation, but we can harden our environment. We can put guardianships, uh, a burger alarm, uh, a guard dog, signs in our house, increase our locks, increase the strength of our windows. There's things that we can do to make our environment harder so that motivated offender doesn't come towards us and see us as the victim. So I'm going to just go over a couple of key points with you. So I mentioned it was a small, sleepy town in Nebraska, less than a 1,000 people, but they had two murders almost in as many weeks. And what does that mean? Well, we know that the routine activities theory relies on the motivation of the offender, a suitable or soft target, and the absence of capable guardianship. So crime can occur anywhere. If someone in your community says we're a small rural church in Texas that would never happen here, that is not the case. The routine activities theory shows it's about the motivation, and we that is the one piece that we cannot control. We cannot control a person's motivation. The second thing to notice here is that this incident happened at 5 a.m. in the morning in the rectory, the house where the Reverend was living. And these incidents happen quickly and without warning. They happen quickly and without warning. So what are you doing within your home to be prepared in the modern world for a home invasion? How quickly can you get to a safe place? How quickly can you call 911? How quickly can you shepherd all your family together? And my third and final point is that perhaps sometimes In and around security, we have difficult questions to answer. And what I mean by that is, do we call 911 or do we go to a place of safety? Now, what we do know is that the Reverend called 911 to alert the police. But what happened to him was that he was murdered, I believe, in what we might call a transition area, like the kitchen to the house. Now, he might have had a difficult decision. Do I go and get my phone and call 911? Or do I go behind a locked door where I can stay safe um, and wait for someone else to call 911, wait for a position where this person leaves or flee out the window, whatever it may look like? So I think this case is an interesting one to demonstrate to us that sometimes we have difficult decisions. Do we call 911 or do we, do we get to a place of safety and then call 911? We know that this reverend was killed in the kitchen area why was he there? We don't know. But the difficult decision I'd ask you is, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to a place of safety first, or are you going to try and call 911 to get your help? So a really interesting story there. I do want to remind you about our decision decks that we have. So if you haven't yet picked up a set of our decision decks. These will help you in these type of situations. They are simple, critical thinking, judgment questions, where they ask you scenarios where you place yourself in a scenario and you say, how would you respond? Now, a lot of people have been saying, well, Simon, they don't give the answers. And no, they don't give the answers because there's so many different variables in a house of worship that that I can't really lead you through. But each of these decks, crisis intervention, threat assessment, safety team, suspicious behavior, conflict escalation, medical response. There's over 360 scenarios here. If you can imagine what it looks like, you're already better prepared. And actually, when this podcast uh, and YouTube video comes out, we've now got them in a very nice, here's the camera, we've now got them in a very nice box set where you can actually get all six decks together on Amazon. So, As always, those are my views and opinion on that short story. 
Um, what did you find fascinating? For me, it's the fact that this reverend has been um, embezzled twice and still seemed to be in a position of trust. Did he have the option to call 911 or get behind a locked door? And the assailant had five warrants out for his arrest. What was he doing in that area anyway? And why did he choose that church? Maybe, just maybe, because he thought it was going to be a soft target. But as always, I love your views and opinions. Please leave a comment wherever you are watching or listening to this video. But for now, you stay safe. You have a blessed day. And I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.